Hello, everybody. It's uh, Matthew Unger here. I'm CEO and founder of I Comply, based in Vancouver, Canada. Really excited to be uh, calling in and joining everybody here. We've got a couple of great panelists talking uh, today about selecting uh, a blockchain and really what considerations do you need to think of uh, from various perspectives for choosing uh, a, a particular blockchain for your tokenization projects. So um, maybe I will pass it off uh, for a roundtable introductions here. Um, I, Ryan, would you like to uh, kick us off? Sure, yeah, absolutely. Um, first, thank you for the opportunity and, and appreciate uh, Security Token Markets for putting this on. Um, my name is Ryan McNay. I work at Republic Crypto as a tokenization advisor. I have been here for a couple of years. Uh, my previous experience was uh, running a Web2 business, uh, which was a mobile and web development agency based out of Washington, D.C., um, and have been around the blockchain space here for about 10 years now. So super excited to get into this conversation today and share what, share what I know about the space. Fantastic. Who wants to go next? <laughs> How about you, Lou? All right. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Lou Morgan. I'm Chief Technology Officer at Black Time Financial. Um, I spent 30 years in the um, CFTC, SEC world as a member of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, partner and a broker and dealer. Um, got into um, blockchain 2017. We started Black Time Financial. Kind of saw the need for um, an infrastructure company for broker dealers, investment banks, banks, credit unions, financial institutions. Um, and uh, Really excited about being here. This is great. And last but not least, uh, Matthew, thanks for having me. Jason and STA guys, thanks again for uh, letting me speak. Uh, Anthony Morrow, CEO of Providence Blockchain Foundation. We are a, a sovereign layer one built in the Cosmos ecosystem, uh, spun out of figure technologies uh, almost two years ago, and now uh, sovereign and uh, decentralized and becoming more so every day. Uh, my background is very much traditional financial services. I spent two decades at BNY Mellon, running various security servicing business, particularly ADRs. Uh, after that, I spent uh, three years running an NYSE uh, listed real estate investment trust and found my way to, to Providence about 15 months ago and will be doing this easily for the rest of my career. There's a lot to do here, right? There's, there's a lot to do here. There's no shortage of work when we're uh, changing the changing the pipes at such a basic level. So, sure. you know, on that note, um, you know, let's talk about layer ones. Um, first and foremost, does the blockchain we choose actually matter um, for different tokenization or or various projects, or can security tokens and specifically be blockchain agnostic? I'm happy to jump in if that's okay. <laughs> yeah. uh, obviously, I'm biased. I have to put that out there. I, I run a layer one, so I'm obviously biased. Um, but I think it matters very much. Um, you know, people have said it doesn't matter what road you travel on. And I think, you know, if you're on an interstate highway, that might be true. But if one blockchain is an interstate highway, and one blockchain is a you know a, a dirt back road with potholes and alligators and crocodiles and you know people throwing rocks at you. Uh, you know one road is safer and one road is less safe. And I would say that that is true for layer ones as well. I would say that you know right now I don't know how many thousands of layer ones there are in the world, but you know B of A and many others have written that the uh, you know the future at some point will be a very small number of blockchains because those are the only ones that can be able to support themselves with fees. Um, and I would argue that for financial services, uh, there'll be you know one or a small number of blockchains for gaming. There'll be a small number of blockchains for um, you know NFT art. There might be another uh, blockchain that's very purpose built for that specific use case. So Providence is purpose built for regulated financial services, and we really have three things that 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 means. What does regulated financial service built for regulated financial services mean? Well, it means three things. It means the technology, uh, the ecosystem, and the governance uh, that are very unique to what we're doing. So first of all, in our governance, we're, we're, we're public, which is important because now you have a whole uh, ecosystem uh, building in your blockchain, essentially for free for the blockchain foundation. Um, but we're properly permissioned for financial services. And what does properly permission means? 
It means you can't write anything you want to the protocol. In every open source and permissionless blockchain, you can put any code that you want on the blockchain. And what that does is it opens up uh, risk avenues, you know, cybersecurity risk avenues and others that we've seen. Yeah, if you're going to be a good control location for financial services, which is what a layer one blockchain needs to be in this industry, you can really never be down. You can never be hacked. You always need to be uh, you know, up and running and available for trading because obviously the, the hour that you're going to be down is the hour that the markets are most volatile. Um, so properly permission and doing things like you know, KYC validators and being ensuring that only uh, approved software goes on the chain that is only built for the financial services ecosystem is really important. Uh, two is the technology. And you know, technology is, is, is important, but most blockchains, you know, open and open source, permissionless, and public blockchains want to be a, you know, an everything blockchain, if you will, sort of the Walmarts of blockchains. And that's fine for a certain business model where you can turn the base protocol into gaming or NFTs or metaverse or financial services, but it's not great if you want to do one really, really well. And what that means is, you know, for the ERC, you know, ERC 70 or ERC 36, 30. 643 standards, um, you need to put a whole bunch of smart contracts on top of the base protocol to get to a layer on which you can start to build. Um, with Providence, we start with our marker protocol you know, further than the ERC 3643 standard, meaning there's no smart contracts involved before you get to that standard. And then you can put some smart contracts on top to get your, to your specific use case. And what I'm trying to say is uh, each smart contract, as everyone knows, invokes some degree of risk. So the fewer smart contracts you have on top of a base protocol, the better. Um, you have cyber risk, you have expense, you have third party risk, uh, and as real regulated financial services institutions move into the space, less risk obviously is, is better than more risk. And then third the, is the ecosystem. Our ecosystem is, uh, this is my last point, I'll stop, uh, <laughs> is by far the largest in real world assets, figure technology has led the way uh, with, with uh, home, home equity lines of credit and mortgages and, and other assets, which I'll talk about later. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, that's uh, really, you know, if you can, you're looking at this from the perspective of, uh, you know, keeping the cost down of operating the blockchain and having a very purpose-built application. Uh, we definitely see a lot of conversations in that in that space where people are looking at purpose-built versus, you know, purpose-built for a specific project, cloning the blockchain, taking an EVM, putting it into a private uh, hosted environment um, versus using public infrastructure. Um, I'm curious, uh, Lou or Ryan, do you have any thoughts on, on, on which blockchains to select and why? We took a little different approach. Uh, Anthony wasn't around when we started. So, uh, <laughs> we, we had to take a little bit of a different approach. Um, we started investigating blockchain early on. We looked at Ethereum. Um, we played around with Hyperledger for a while. Um, Hyperledger had, um, I was, um, being sponsored a lot by IBM. Um, IBM had a, the, a project called Worldwire, um, which was a worldwide payments, um, network. And we started poking around that. That's pretty cool. And it was running on Stellar. Um, we looked at Stellar, we looked at Ripple. Ripple was a little, um, closed so to speak at the time uh you had to be kind of in the club to 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 get on board um stellar was open source um and we looked at that and we said okay this this will work for us we come from this world um uh, it was purpose built for financial transactions which we knew that was our space right so um we we started developing a platform infrastructure for stellar uh hoping that um you know, our target clients would come around and see that this would work in the long run and provide a lot of efficiencies. And thank goodness uh, we've got some examples out there now. Uh, Franklin Templeton, Wisdom Tree, MoneyGram, all running on Stellar. Um, so we're pretty happy with that. Um, it's got a lot of the things that financial, tra um, you know, financial institutions need. We have a there's a built in DEX on layer one. Um, there's built-in liquidity pools on layer one. Um, we're about to go live with a smart contract platform that's um, probably state-of-the-art and Rust programs compiling down into Wasm, running on a VM that's super fast and super efficient, maybe a ma an order of magnitude um, less in cost. 
So uh, we're pretty excited about that. Um, that's kind of where we sit um, in the in the space there. Awesome, thanks, Ryan. Any, any thoughts? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think I um, I love the, uh, the the hearing the thoughts from both. I think uh, I take a little bit of a hybrid approach here at Republic because um, we do remain chain agnostic uh, for the most part here. Um, so the the way that I look at it is the blockchain is simply the the foundation uh, or the pavement in this case, if we're, if we're talking about roads, and then the token developers and issuers kind of organize the roads on top of that. Um, so what we do is when whenever we have somebody come into us, they usually go through our advisory services in which we'll develop economies and, and things like that, if we're talking about utility tokens. But more so than that, um, I really take um, pride in this where it's, it's more than just you know selecting a trending name. It's really about aligning project objectives uh, with platform capabilities or protocol capabilities. So um, I like to look and, and I conduct my protocol analysis here with my clients and in three buckets. Uh, one is objectively, two is subjective, subjectively, and three is actionably. Um, and so from an objective standpoint, right, if, if a client is coming to us with a utility token, we'll analyze documentation that our, uh, shout out to our killer you know, economics team, Puts, puts together, we'll digest all of that. But even if it's just a business coming to tokenize something, right, we'll, we'll intake all of these documents um, to really look at the usage demands um, that their product will need of the, the blockchain of their choosing. Um, on top of that, we also have a number of different matrices, internal um, data rooms that we use to compare blockchains, uh, whether that's transactions per second or costs per transaction, wallet support, um, one of the things that I really like to think about uh, with blockchains is things like developer and community support. Um, you'll, I've ran, run into so many um, situations where documentation is incomplete and you're actually relying on the community to help support. Um, so I, I really like to look at that as well as future roadmap development, right? It's going back to aligning projects uh, with protocols. Um, so that's from an objective standpoint. From a subjective standpoint, right, we have a lot of clients that come to us that have already started conversations with protocols, whether that be um, they have a relationship or they're looking into the grant or, or venture funding out of a, a protocol. Uh, we will take those in and we will take that into consideration, um, as well as blockchain specification. I think we we're kind of talking a little bit, Anthony had mentioned about like gaming versus DeFi. Um, so we definitely and, and certainly look at that. And then actionably, um, it, look, it's a small, it's a still a small uh, unit. We are in crypto. So we make sure that all of our teams have open lines of communication with all protocols to make the best decision for them moving forward. We really want to make sure that the protocol that they choose scales with them um, and provides the value that they're looking for. So that's how we approach it here at Republic. Cool. That's, that's fantastic. When you guys look at different blockchains or you're assessing or, you know, different people, um, there's often some a two by two classification of public blockchains on the top versus private and then permissioned and permissionless. And, and I think we see, um, we see a lot of different, uh, you know, examples of this uh, in the market. And I'd be curious with the customers that you guys work with, Ryan, do you see um, interest in private and permission blockchains or is it generally using um, more public blockchain infrastructure? Yeah, it's it's we have clients from all over, uh, a wide wide array of clients, and I would say most of the time you you still run into kind of like that um, blockchain trilemma, right? Which is security, uh, scalability, uh, and then decentralization. You kind of got to pick two, uh, two of the three. Um, so it really depends. I think with each use case, uh, we're wildly different. We work with a, a large array of founders um, and enterprises coming in to tokenize. So um, that's that's a hard one to answer. Maybe pass it off to Anthony and Lou and, and what they're seeing with with people that they're working with. So what, what, how we're solving those problems here at Provenance is we're absolutely seeing the demand for private and permissioned networks from larger asset managers and just about every bank in the U.S. because the regulators are telling them that that's the way that they need to proceed. Um, and that is an interim step, I believe. I think the the, the debate, the overall debate in, in crypto blockchain is that public is clearly the future. Um, but the present is is a mixed. And you know, banks and large asset managers, as I was saying, are, you know, have the need for for private and permissioned. 
But then they also want to make sure that their private and permissioned network isn't a dead end street to go back to our street analogy. They want to make sure that it's interoperable into other areas for a time in the future, which everyone believes will come when uh, public, but you know, properly permissioned is the route forward for banks and asset managers. So uh, again, we were we were built in, in Hyperledger Fabric uh, four years ago when Mike Cagney started the Providence chain. Uh, they moved over to the Cosmos ecosystem uh, two years ago as Cosmos started to develop as you know, people more technological than I can can talk about the merits of that uh, versus the EVM chains. But um, yeah, more importantly, it allows the IBC connection, inter-blockchain connections to other Cosmos-based networks in a, you know, I'm not going to say completely safe, but in a recognized safe uh, transition. So within the Cosmos, you're able to spin up blockchains pretty much for every use case. So we obviously have our main net with our big pool of validators, but the banks that are operating, and we're working with several, are all operating on private zones, we call them. It's not unlike an avalanche subnet, they're called private zones in the Providence ecosystem. And in that zone, you can create you know, every aspect of your chain, whether or not you have, you know, whether you have gas or not, how gas is paid, is it paid in US dollars or hash, or do you have zero gas? Uh, how many validators do you have? What, what's the permissioning look like? Uh, all that is available in a zone. You can, you know, it's essentially a you know, private sandbox. And at some point in the future, when you're ready to, it really is a very simple transition into mainnet or they'll also then into mainnet into anywhere else in the Cosmos ecosystem. And this is important because, you know, we've seen a couple of private permissioned blockchains go out of business. And if you've got assets that are very specifically built for those private permissioned blockchains, where do you go? You have to rewrite your code. You have to transition all your assets. You have to disrupt your investor base. It's just, it's not a good look for the industry when that happens. So interoperability is key. Uh, being, able to, being able to move from private to public is key. And these are all the things that we think about all the time. Great. Move. Yeah, I would agree. Um, interoperability is key. Um, we've um, our clients have asked for a couple of other blockchains just to be redundant. Um, so while I'm not an expert in them, um, we have had um, uh, development in Algorand, Avalanche, Polygon. Um, so we poked around in those. Um, there's great aspects to all those. Um, we probably haven't seen, I, I, we're probably in a little different space than Anthony is um, in that some of our clients are not tokenizing. They're interested in payments, uh, things like that. So we kind of have to look at a, a little bigger picture of things. So um, we kind of, lean a little bit more towards the permissioned public blockchain, um, permissioned assets, excuse me, permissioned assets on a public blockchain, um, which um, Stellar does pretty well. Um, there's other blockchains that do that well also. Um, so, but we're in a, you know, we can be in a little different space than, um, than um, Anthony is and, so that's kind of where we're at. Awesome, thank you. We'll do, we'll do a deep dive and, after this, Lou. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. There's, so I'm, I'm curious, there's something you know, here around uh, the conversation around interoperability and you know, the, the holy grail of all the blockchains uh, meshing together uh, seamlessly. Yeah. What's what's from the different perspectives you guys have, what do you see as, the, as some of the barriers to that interoperability today? So I can I can jump in. We're we're working on. Uh, I talked about this a little bit, and we had our third quarter call the other day. And the the names will come out next week. I, I wish they were available today so I could talk about them. But I'll just say a very large U.S. bank has its own internal blockchain network, and they're building an interoperability project with ourselves and via Axelar uh, to other large asset managers with the goal of having a client on their internal bank network having an alternative asset portfolio and being able to index it and importantly rebalance it interoperable with an interoperability through uh again Providence Axelar into the Providence ecosystem. So 
we've got a couple of funds. Apollo has a big fund on, on Providence and there's there's others. But if you wanted to rebalance that portfolio, let's say you know, investment one was up 60%, investment down two was 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 down 10%. How do you rebalance back, that back to an index uh, across multiple blockchains? So interoperability is the key. And, and uh, firms like Axelar, Layer Zero, uh, are providing a, a way to, to make both private and public blockchains uh, you know, interact with each other in a, you know, I'm not going to say completely safe, but a safer way than has happened in, in crypto trading before. And again, yeah. if you're within Cosmos, great, but we we rec recognize the world isn't yet all on Cosmos. So you have to be able to go between EVM chains, private chains, and, you know, other, other blockchain networks. So look for that announcement in the next week or so. They're going to do a big demo at the Singapore FinTech Festival in uh, four weeks time. So I think it'll be one of the cooler things, cooler projects that that gets announced. Yeah, I think awesome. you, you hit on the holy grail there. It, it, you know, we we saw this all in the, um, you know, in the in the financial markets in the, you know, late eighties, early nineties, where everybody had to start getting connected to each other, right? All the ECNs had to connect to each other, and it was. A bit of an issue, but then we had the fixed protocol come along, and the same thing will happen in blockchain technology. Um, we're going to call that bridging, right? And we're going to be able to bridge between different blockchains, and the bridges themselves need to be trusted. Okay, and when we can have, when we have um, bridges that are run by trusted entities, and this could be by banks, broker dealers, um, some regulated entity, um, we're going to see an explosion in, in, in business, I think. Um, and then people can, then people will be able to run on a blockchain that suits them. But if, if, if somebody wants to just buy and hold something, they can move it to their blockchain or do whatever they want. Maybe they have to move USDC a lot and they need a cheap blockchain to do that, but they need to maybe trade on on provenance. So and that's that's exactly where the, the, the there's several ATSs in our space and obviously there's not enough business to go around for for all of them right now. Um, yeah, you know, NASDAQ, you're absolutely right, Lou, evolved as a collection of broker dealers. And then the, the, the predecessor to NASDAQ was the NASD. Before yep. that, it was actually FINRA who put an electronic communication network across all the broker dealers. And hey, lo and behold, NASDAQ exploded in, in liquidity. Uh, you know, tech, rise of tech didn't, didn't hurt either. But the liquidity that was enabled by the ECN that, that, that went across, it was safe, effective, cheaper, faster, and safer than the telephone. Uh, bid system that came before it. So we need that moment in blockchain. It's not in blockchain trading. It's not here yet because there's no real secondary market liquidity really across any private asset classes. It's not a blockchain specific issue. Uh, but when that comes, it'll you know, blockchain will support that network in a way that it it would never would have grown without that. Yep. Yeah. And and I just you know I love that everyone's touching here on interoperability. I think that is one of the key points, um, especially that we emphasize here. Uh, interoperability. Uh, a lot of clients that I'm I'm launching right now, a little bit on the utility side as well, are uh, EVM compatible chains. We also rec we always recommend them to be near mainnet, right? Always near uh, Ethereum. They can bridge to other L2s if necessary. But the bridges themselves, I I believe, need a little bit of work. Uh, we've seen a lot of changes, some unannounced changes or uh, uh, not highlighted uh, changes to some of these bridges. Um, and I think as we we're, we're still an early industry. As we move forward, these bridges will get better and more secure and safer, and we'll feel confident moving assets in between bridges. And I think that's when true interoperability will shine. Fantastic. So I'm curious, you know, uh, from our perspective, we've uh, worked with, you know, again, many different blockchains, and it is usually, uh, I would say, similar to what you were saying, Lou, is, uh, you know, the creating the permissioning infrastructure for a public chain. Um, has been a lot of the work that we've done in the space. Um, my area of focus has mostly been in the EVM uh, compatibility network as well. So, um, you know, when we're looking at different blockchains, one of the things that we had to consider is that, you know, certain blockchains from a legal or regulatory compliance perspective weren't necessarily suited for certain applications. Um, and I'm curious, when you guys uh, look at these projects, do you ever see anything um, from the compliance, the regulatory compliance, uh, where a certain blockchain might uh, favor another one, and why? 
Uh, was that for me? Uh, for everybody. Oh. For everyone. If you jump right in, yeah. Well, the um, probably, I can't remember exactly. It was probably about three years ago. Um, the regulated institutions tra- was started poking around on Stellar. And, and one of the things the SEC um, said that you have to have is cl- clawback provision. Um, and you need a revocable so that if there's fraudulent activity, um, you can revoke an asset from an account. That was a whole protocol change for, for Stellar, um, or a, not a change, an upgrade. Um, that was protocol by, I'm going to say 18. Um, and, uh, that gave the ability, um, to, I think the wisdom tree and the Franklin Templeton's of the world to um, be able to be issue a regulatory compliant on stellar a regulatory compliant asset on stellar. Um, so that was a big thing. Um, and if a blood, if a blockchain wants to issue a regular um, regulated, if someone wants to issue a regulated asset on a blockchain, they need that ability in the United States if they want to do it compliantly. Yep. I would just, in addition to you know freezing, I would say force transfer and ownership yeah. roles and wallet identity and compliance roles, you know, uh, sanctioning, you know, <laughs> all, all these things that regulated financial services has, a blockchain needs to have as well. And going back to some of the benefits of Providence, these are all toggles in our marker. You, you can select them or not when you spin up a, a new marker for a new security. Um, they're not smart contracts that you have to write in. Uh, yeah, I'd also go back to the cap table, right? Uh, I, I, my first year in, in uh, Bank of New York, I learned everything I could about transfer agents and, and, and cap tables, because that's where securities start to get ledgered. And you know, if, if that's not done right, everything else falls apart. Um, we also have a cap table and ledgering ability within Providence. And again, being built in the protocol makes a very big difference, because if, in the, if it's in a smart contract, any changes that happen anywhere else in other smart contracts or in the protocol affect each smart contract. So having to go back and redo all the smart contracts really uh, creates a, a vector for risk. So you know, we, we, we understood all that. Uh, we thought through all those issues. We, you know, we have some security servicing experts within our shop, and we designed the protocol to be you know, expert for security servicing, and it really has resonated. Another thing that's really important is is escrow and exchange. On most blockchains, when you want to trade an asset, you have to pledge the assets to the blockchain and they get frozen, right? Um, and only the, the transaction only execute once uh, you know both sides are met, but you ha- you could have a bid you know encumbered and sitting out there for you know months if you wanted to. Um, we have capabilities where it's it stays within your wallet and it's only es- it's escrowed in your wallet and it only transacts when the transaction happens. But more importantly, you get to keep control of it, not the blockchain transfer agent. There's things like that that we're thinking about on an everyday basis that really make a difference. That sounds like a really cool feature. Yeah, and and uh, love to love to hear these as well. Um, I think the way that I look at it, right, is. Um, you know, the, the blockchains are where the, the security tokens are developed and issued, but the, the blockchains themselves aren't capable um, to encompass all of the features required for securities right now. And so I think a lot of that is built on top of that. Um, we introduced something called ERC, you know, 1404 is a, an older standard, but we introduced 1404 Prime recently um, in combination with a, a token developer named Upside, which is really interesting. Um but there's an example like the uh, SEC doesn't allow for um, sole recording of ownership to be done directly on chain. And so we have to handle that KYC AML functionality off chain. Right. And so um, I think as we're continuing to build this out, um, you're going to, as I mentioned, the blockchain to me is that road. And then the, the, the issuers and developers um, of the tokens will actually build the roads on top of that in, in the way that we navigate security. So I think a lot of that functionality may come in, come into play there. At least how I'm seeing it from my side right now. Yeah, we need we need to talk also, Ryan. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, we 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 saw all those issues. I mean, frankly, you know, ERC thirty six forty three is a great standard, but how many smart contracts do you need to get there? Right. This is all literally built in the protocol on Providence. I'll be hitting you up after this call. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
I just want to, uh, as thank you everyone has said, uh, mention also to anyone in the audience, uh, if you want to uh, submit any questions, you can use the chat feature in the Zoom uh, and those should uh, end up uh, popping up in the feed here. So we'll watch for those. Uh, go ahead and post any questions if anyone has. Um, and uh, as we moving forward, um, is the when you're looking at the blockchains and of course you know a, a completely private blockchain um private doesn't necessarily mean it's not decentralized um and so does the decentralization level of a blockchain matter for the different applications that you see or is it you know certain blockchains you can move a proof of authority and essentially centralize it all to one point right uh consensus protocol or you could choose to also move it to uh, you know, something like more of the public blockchains where there's still a proof of work element or proof of stake, et cetera. So does the consensus algorithm matter and and, and the level of decentralization matter um, in, with the customers that you deal with? I mean, it, it has to, right? Um, so if you have a private zone on Providence, you could spin it up with, you know, three validators and you know, how decentralized is three validators, right? You should probably have a dozen validators, but the more validators you have, the more expensive your private network becomes and start, starts to, you know, change the, the benefits of the blockchain. So it, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, it's, it's a consideration for sure that uh, those wanting private and permission blockchains need to, need to have. I, I, I really think it is an interim step. So, for instance, the way that we're we're dealing with cap tables, and I, I, I absolutely hear you, Ryan, that the SEC doesn't want, yeah, you know, the, the source of truth can't be on blockchain right now. It's really one of the one technologies that they mandate, which is odd, but it is what it is. So, what you have is a pseudonymized uh, cap table on blockchain, and then the off-chain transfer agent just keeps the the master key of what the pseudonyms are. Uh, you can do, you know, KYC and AML on those pseudonymized because you know who they are at the end of the day. Um, you know, it's coming in innovations, and these are all little innovations that add up to to a big deal. But back to you know, private private zones and private information chains, yeah, they're they're never going to be as robust as 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 the public network. Um, the, the economics are different, the tokenomics are different, um, but it is an absolutely needed interim step until we get to more more public. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm, Brian, Lou, and Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh yeah, just a, just a quick note is um, you know when we go back to like the blockchain trilemma, um, security, scalability, decentralization, and trying to choose the two of the three. Um, one of the things that I think about is um, the decentralized nature of housing security tokens. Maybe from my perspective, not as important, um, just because the assets are already transfer restricted. Um, and then, like considering on a public blockchain, um, w w I actually heard this. It was a really good point. Was um, one one consideration for securities is that um, transactions may be coordinated, settled, and rewarded by validators who are like participating in uh, nefarious or illegal activity, um, and thus issuers may be rewarding, rewarding or indirectly compensating illegal activity. And it was it was a really kind of interesting point that was brought up um, that's been sticking with me, and I'm, I'm giving it some thought. So that's kind of just my perspective, again, but as things are changing, uh, like Anthony said, we're going to be learning a lot here. Yeah, that was a good point, and that was Anthony's point yesterday. Um, and I, um, so we've seen um, people interested in speed and cost, right? And that leads to kind of which blockchain you might go with just based on the consensus algorithm, right? So there's proof of work, proof of stake, um, federated Byzantine, um, all kinds, of, there's, there's a lot of them out there, right? And some are greener, some are cost intensive, some blockchains burn the transaction fees, some reward the validators. That all comes into play um, and is a consideration for some people, right? Uh, that want to issue, they're, they're going to have specifics that they're going to have to adhere to um, for a blockchain. So 
all those things come into play. Yeah, for sure. And, and it's why I think general purpose blockchains aren't fit for finan regulated financial services. They're absolutely fine for a lot of use cases. And crypto trading, you know, the, the crypto world all of a sudden discovered real world assets as crypto volumes declined. Uh, but it's hard to adapt crypto a crypto mindset into traditional financial services. What I think is going to happen is traditional financial services are going to adapt some of the best practices from the crypto industry, and we're going to meet in the middle. Yeah, uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Speed is right speed is super important for crypto trading, and it would be if there were you know equity trading on on chain as well. But it's not super important for you know trading mortgages or or credit or private equity. I mean. These are not high frequency assets, and a, and a five second block time is is absolutely fine for trading these assets. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And the number of you know when you're looking at these uh, you know private markets, tokenization of private capital, private equity, etc. Um, the the cost of the transaction, even if you use online database Web two solutions, is still like you know twenty to a hundred dollars a transaction. Um, and yet, the, you know, a, a security token could execute that for a lot less. So uh, that's really, uh, really quite fascinating. Um, I think when we're looking at uh, the comments here, we've got questions. We have a question for Ryan. One second. Here. We have a question for Ryan uh, asking, can you rank order the level of interest you're seeing in blockchains and which blockchains are, they, are people asking for? So. I don't know. Do you have a? Do you see a top three or five list with the customers that you deal with, Brian? Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, um, we again we remain chain agnostic. Uh, we see some similarities in projects that we are working with, especially on the utility uh, utility token side. Um, a lot of them are they want to be near Ethereum mainnet, uh, main chain uh, L1, if you want. Um, they will also look at things like Polygon. You know, a, a lot of people are starting to talk about Base, which I'm really excited about. Um, I'd be hard hard pressed to, to to give an exact ranking of these because it really, as we go back to to my original comment, right? It's project objectives with protocol um, specifications, and so we try to match those two. So it really varies depend on use use case. Um, so that that's a hard one to answer, but um, yeah, some of the popular ones are are certainly there at the top um, and in consideration for our clients. Mm -hmm. What about Lou and Anthony from your side? Do you do you hear people um, looking at you know if you're on this if you're on Stellar like why not why not Ethereum why not Bitcoin Satoshi Vision? Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you hear uh, do you hear any of those types of questions? I mean, what, we we've been focused on institutional financial services, really not crypto. I mean, we are you know we'll have crypto trading on in Providence at some point. Uh, figures building a marketplace. They believe that will do both uh, securities through an ATS and digital assets through a DEX. So that will probably be done on a private zone of Providence that has a smaller block time. But the use cases that were focused on on mainnet really are regulated financial services. And um, yeah, as I said, time doesn't really matter. But what we found is you need to do things cheaper, faster, and safer than TradFi, not necessarily the crypto world. So the you know other chains are absolutely fine for those use cases. But I think, again, if you can spin up cheaper, faster, and safer versus TradFi, you're going to win. So every every blockchain, I think, will be you know cheaper and faster. But I think everyone else falls down on safer, right? Is your blockchain safer than you have different risks for sure? But are they you know diminished compared? Are you de-risking financial services use cases? And again, that's where our technology and our ecosystem come in. And you know, I like to say, so the only industry that's been disrupted by blockchain anywhere in the world is home equity lines of credit, and that's what Figure and its, its partners. They've got 10 of the 20 largest um, mortgage originators on our platform today, on Figures platform, which uses provenance. And they've issued 6% of all HELOCs that have been done last year and this year, which is a massive number if you think about an asset class. Like no other asset class that we speak about in, in, our, in our blockchain world has, I would even think, 0.1% of that asset class has been disrupted. This is a full 6%. So it's going to be asset class by asset class. It's going to be user base by user base. And you know, having issued $15 billion of securities all institutionally, it's important to say that you know, if these were done in the crypto retail world, the crypto retail press would go crazy. Right. If you instead of doing $15 billion to you know, a handful of institutional investors, you did $15 billion to you know, 30,000 crypto wallets, you know, the crypto world would go nuts. But in the asset-backed securities world, $15 billion is really not a lot of money. Right? 
to me, it's a lot of money, but to the yeah. EBS world, it's not a lot of money. And in the crypto world, it would just blow everybody's minds that you can do that much real world assets. Yeah, there's there's definitely uh, you know the numbers are are still very small within the crypto space, and I think there's a lot of uh, 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 starting to develop. There's a, a distinction that's starting to develop about the idea of blockchain in financial services versus uh, blockchain in the crypto use case. And this is where the consideration of you know do you use a public chain, a private chain, you know ecosystem start to really make a big difference because it's not the same. Uh, the use case, the customers, the everything is very different, right? The needs are very different. Um, and so how do you get the benefits of blockchain without necessarily taking on additional new risk? It's a big part of uh, a lot of people's dis, uh, uh, decision-making process. I know we've been, you know, and iComply has been working in this space for six years. I've been doing it a couple of years before that and we've seen a, definitely trends of blockchains right there's you know ethereum and then you know another chain here and then another chain there we see layer two bitcoin we see stellar we see solana um there's a lot of this stuff happening even in financial services uh, applications um and so you know at the same time we do see um these private chain and private network applications uh, like central bank digital currencies i don't think a lot of people don't realize but there is already a, a testing platform for central banks um, and several central banks have uh, live central bank digital currencies running on uh, an EVM clone called Embridge. And, uh, you know, that's running in a private, I think, uh, probably an Asia type of environment, but a private POA network. And so you, we see a lot of these different takes coming at it from, you know, from one way or another, people tackling it in different ways. Um, and uh, so I'm curious when you guys are looking at the you know the, the decisioning of community with a blockchain. I think that was something that uh, each of you have kind of mentioned. You know, what is, what are the different benefits when you're thinking of provenance? Uh, you know, is there a lot a, a strong development community? Is it easy to uh, to find stakeholders and partners? And, and same thing even with with what you're doing in Stellar and and of course uh, your space, Ryan. Yeah. The the ecosystem in in in, at, in Stellar is, is big. Uh, I had the uh, good fortune of attending the um, World Conference in Madrid uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, there were over 500 developers and and advocates there of the chain. Um, I'm really happy with that. Um, it gives me a little comfort. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I think. I, I like that. When I'm looking at other chains, when my clients come to me and say, "Yeah, we'll do Stellar, but give me, I, I need, I need a backup, right? Because I'm a regulated financial institution. I can't have one chain." So then we go through the list of, and of the ones that can handle their asset, and uh, then I have to go look and say, "Well, that one only has ten guys on their Discord channel." Uh, and that's going to be a really tricky one to to develop for. And then, you know, that I kind of look at that kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So, cool. Thank you. Yeah, I could, I could jump in real quick. In terms of like community and developer support, I mean, it's just something that I would say more so that I run into on the utility side of things, utility token side of things. Um, the one thing is I look at commits and GitHub and who's contributing mm -hmm. to the code base. That's a super important metric to look at. Um, you're always going to need help from someone, right? And so whether that be the actual protocol itself um, and the engineers on the team or developers, um, they've been super, super, super helpful um, and got me out of some situations as we've been developing here. Um, and then third, like, and again, this is more of a reference to like our utility clients, but if you have a lot of people contributing to the network and who are developing on top of it, you can also find a lot of early adopters who are willing to work on your product, not, not necessarily just work on your product, but be a part of that ecosystem, test it out. And you're getting really valuable feedback there. So you just want to make sure that there's a community around this protocol. Um, it's been super, super helpful for me. Yeah, and I'd agree with all that. I'd say the, the you know Cosmos is an ascending technology. I think DYDX just moved from ETH to Cosmos. That was kind of a big deal. 
um, because they wanted to control their own environment. It's just a different way to look at a blockchain network. Um, you know, when I was at Bank of New York, we had to have a living will and a resolution and recovery plan. And I think that needs to be an important step if we are as a blockchain uh, layer one going to be a good control location, i.e. what happens to you if the chain you know, ever went away or shut down or was hacked. Um, you know, a lot of other blockchains who are, you know, blockchains that aren't, aren't in the Cosmos ecosystem don't have the ability to, to transfer seamlessly. And IBC allows, you know, you, you can move, you know, you can move from Providence to, you know, Osmosis or DYDX literally with a push of a button in a completely safe manner because it's built in the internet of blockchains. Um, you know, as I said, it's an ascendant technology and you benefit from thousands of developers in the Cosmos ecosystem. But, you know, so we, we, we take parts of that code, but we can also develop our own that is meant specifically for the Providence network. So it really is the best of both worlds. Wow, fantastic. Well, we've got a few minutes here. Um, I'd be curious, is there any uh, any thoughts from each of you on other things that people should be considering other than the questions that we've covered, some, some key key takeaways as people are looking at Looking into tokenization and um, and maybe trying to assess uh, you know assess how this would impact the organization. What are some of the risks they have to think about, etc. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say I think it's the you know, the first or second batter in the top of the first inning for, for this industry. Uh, I think it's a very interesting time. I think uh, the formula, the secret formula, is cheaper, faster, and safer than traditional financial services. And I think we're starting to build out all those paradigms right now. I think the immediate future for the larger institutions is private and permission with a roadmap to public and, and you know properly permissioned. You got to get the blocking and tackling right. It's a security service for you know for what we're talking about, you know, tokenizing financial assets, obviously. Um, you know, it's a security servicing construct mindset that you need to think about. How do you perfect assets? How do you uh, ensure that there's no double rehypothecation of assets? Um, you know, asset protection is absolutely key because when things go bad that's when the networks get tested. Um, and you always have to be up and you always have to be uh, you know, doing the right thing. So it's not a sexy story, financial services blockchain. Uh, I've spoke to some you know, um, you know, media. <laughs> they said, where's the, where's the sexiness? Uh, sorry, we don't have, a, you know, we don't have the, the, you know, the things that make the headlines going on in, in our network. We are at our core, a custodian of assets and a security servicer. Uh, building products for, uh, you know, rewiring the operating system of financial services. And that's what we do every day. And it's going to get more exciting all the time. Yep. We're Joe the plumber, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, you know, just final thoughts are here. You know, when you're choosing a blockchain, um, you know, make sure it's the one that suits your asset, right? Um, make sure that, um, you know, your blockchain is going to be scalable in the future. Um, make sure it's good and decentralized. Um, um, make sure there's a good ecosystem in there so you can get help when you need it. Um, and, uh, yeah, that should get you on your way. <laughs> Yeah, I, I echo all the same sentiment as both of you, Anthony. I love the sports references. Uh, those, are, those are great for me. But uh, yeah, I, I would say the same exact things. Um, and I know there's probably some people that, again, I focus a lot on both security and utility tokens. And the one piece of advice for if anybody's doing a utility token on my side um, or listening, don't always, every client that comes to me, they get really, their eyes open wide. If they get a check from a venture team to come build on the blockchain, make sure that your project um, needs are met by that blockchain. Don't just go for the first check. You want to be able to scale with this project. Look at the roadmap. Look at the community support. Make sure they're going in the same direction you are, um, because this is setting the foundation for the rest of your, the rest of your business. So that's the only uh, extra tidbit that I would add on at the end there. Yeah, that's fantastic. Thank you. And uh, I think um, just waiting to see if we have any other questions. This is a last call for anyone in the audience, um, but. Uh, I think one of the things that we see a lot of is uh, in this space is people are looking at it like you were saying, Ryan, it's a bit of like, uh, you know, I heard about this uh, one blockchain, so we, we have to do it here. And taking that approach of really uh, assessing and, you know, you mentioned that even the whole matrix of decision, you know, I think it's super important. Um, so hey. I'd like to thank everyone for, hey. sorry, what's that? Go ahead. 
No, I was going to say, I, I just almost thought of this as, as I go through protocol analysis with future clients is to actually just put protocol one, two, and three at the top, hide the names and let them choose from there because everybody gets attracted by the, the, you know, the blue light, the next big thing. And it's really like focus on what matters and that's the fundamentals. Yep. I don't have a good sports reference there, but I'm sure, I'm sure you're cooking one. <laughs> Build it and they will come, right? <laughs> yeah, there we go. There we go. Um, excellent. Well, uh, Jason, are you still with us here? Anything you'd like us to do before we wrap up? No, I just want to thank all of you for your time and sharing uh, each of your perspectives with our audience here. Obviously, selecting a blockchain is something that comes up in conversation for every issuer, you know, uh, at, at one point or another. So thank you all for your insights there. Um, I'd like to direct you all. Oh, before that, actually, thank you, Matthew, for moderating and doing such a great job. And for that, uh, we uh, we're we're creating great content for our audience here. Uh, so that being said, we are at the end of this hour. So we will direct you guys over to the next session, which will be distribution strategies uh, by the Security Token Advisors team. So bear with us while we transition up here. And thank you very much, all. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.